Today's episode of Transform Your Workplace is brought to you by Zenium HR. Make sure to learn more about Zenium's complete HR and payroll solution at zeniumhr.com. And if you're not in the market for payroll or HR, make sure to go check out our e-learning. We have on-demand e-learning courses like time management, emotional intelligence, HR basics, leadership essentials, and so much more. And they're only $49 each. Go check them out at zeniumhr.com slash courses. Well, today's episode is kind of a unique one. I've only done this a few times where I flip the script a little bit and I have somebody else interview me. I invited Al Nodarse on the podcast. He's a Zenium colleague. And he had this idea. I thought it was interesting. He He's always recognized that I've had a side hustle, and many of you probably don't know that about me, but I've had a side hustle for many years, probably since 2011, where I've done marketing and consulting on the side, and Zenium supported it, and I've been very open about it. Anyway, so Al asked me about it, and we just kind of dive into that and whether employers should be okay with that, and we just kind of had a candid conversation about the pros and the cons and you know whether an employer should support employees who want a side hustle. It's challenging times out there. And I think people are trying to make money in a lot of different ways, have multiple income streams. I personally think it's the right thing to do. It's security and safety and, you know, my family are everything. And so having multiple income streams helps my family and grow and I keeps me engaged and all that. So you're going to hear all about my thoughts and we dive into the employer side a little bit and I hope you enjoyed this. I, I enjoyed being interviewed and being on the other side of the microphone. It's kind of fun. I'm used to asking the questions, so I felt a little, a little uncomfortable about it, but I, I hope you get value from hearing something like this. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, we got some new artwork out for the podcast. So hopefully I didn't throw you off too much and I hope you like what you see and as always, make sure to connect with me. I'm power user on LinkedIn, so I'm always there. Instagram is the other place I am at a lot. And I love direct messages from people. I love hearing how you're liking the show, what topics that you want to hear about. In fact, I get a lot of direct messages about like, hey, have you had like so-and-so on the show? Or have you talked about this topic? I don't think you have. I mean, in 350 episodes or whatever is out at this point, I've covered a lot of ground. But there's so much to talk about. And, you know, these topics I've tried to bring on are in the effort to transform a workplace culture in a positive way. So if you ever run across an author, a speaker, somebody who just ha has a lot of thought leadership around a certain subject matter, and you think they would be great on the show, connect me, please. I'm, I'm really interested in having fascinating, interesting people who have something to say that's unique on the show. And it's all to benefit your workplaces and your professional development as a leader, as an HR professional. So I hope you're loving the show. And I hope you like this episode with Al Nodarse. Enjoy, and we'll talk to you next Tuesday. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, so first question, I guess, is, you know, how did you get started with the side hustle? Yeah, it was interesting. So I've been with Zenium since 2008. And as you know, I started in more of an operations role. And as my uh, as I started grabbing onto marketing tasks and building out, we didn't have marketing. So as we were building out the marketing function within Zenium, you know, I was building a website, doing search engine optimization. I was learning all these marketing skills. And as I was talking to people, whether networking or even some Zenium clients and, and other people within my network, a lot of people were asking me like, how do you do this? How do you do this? And so I started taking on little projects and it was never intentional. It was just one of those things where I was like, yeah, I can build a website. You know, built Zenium's website on WordPress and, a, and another platform before. And so some people had asked me like, hey, hey, I just need a website. So I take on a project like that. And that's really, that was really the genesis of it. Like I was doing a bunch of random marketing things, building websites, doing search engine optimization, 
projects. I was blogging for people and it just sort of snowballed over time. And it's been something I've been doing since I think 2010. Wow. So it didn't start with you having an idea of doing this. It was driven by clients coming to you and asking. Yeah. I don't know if it was just pure reputation or marketing is confusing. I think for a lot of people, it's really noisy and it's with all the tech now it gets even more confusing. Like, where do I start? How do I even build a website? How do I do pay-per-click? Like there's just all all these questions around it. So people would naturally ask and I'm like, I would just give them the answers in a lot of cases or walk them through it. And And then at the end of the day, it's much like anything with marketing. It's like, kind of give away a little bit of information, try to help them through it. And then they're like, eh, I don't, I don't even want to learn this. Like, can you just do it for me? And, and because I was helping people for nothing, they would eventually be like, Hey, I, can you build a website for me? Got and, it. and it just sort of happened organically and still doing it to this day. But let me ask you, because the first time I met you, I remember just being blown away that Xenium, you know, helped pay for your equipment and to get your little side hustle going. And I was like, wow, you're kidding me. I yeah. Mean, can't believe they did that. But when you first started, I mean, did you have to be cautious because, hmm. you know, people might be looking, it's like, what, what is Brandon doing? He's doing all this stuff on the side, but you're still doing your job. Yeah. You're adding yeah. value. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and even with the equipment conversation, I'm not really using Zenium's equipment other than um, maybe for podcasting or something, but even then I'm not really doing that on a side hustle basis. So everything that I'm doing is pretty low overhead if you think about it. So I have my own computer at home. Everything is internet based. So luckily, there's not really a conflict as far as like, I'm not really doing this on work time. It's truly a side hustle. It's like, I always tell people, it's like, look, if you want to hire me, it's nights and weekends sort of thing. So as far as like Zenium or any employer should worry about is if you just set those ground rules up of like, look, you can't use our stuff or you can, like you just make sure to have that conversation up front or you're like, you can't do this during work time, obviously. Like you're getting paid to do a job as your full-time job. Like if, if you're willing to do a side hustle on a nights and weekends basis, that's totally fine. And that that was the agreement I had really set up. Got it. And with the gig economy now, I mean, it seems to me, I mean, we see how difficult it is for folks to recruit folks. So yeah. do you think this is something that CEOs need to be more mindful of, not only to find good people, but to keep them too? Yeah, I think the the gig economy is not going away. There's more opportunities than ever to have a side hustle. I mean, just in my industry alone, there's, and write this down if you need any of this stuff, but like there's Fiverr.com, there's Upwork.com. And these are like creative platforms that people like me or even you know, even more creative people, they're there ready to take work. So if you need a PowerPoint done or Excel training or whatever, you can hire some of these people on a random basis through this platform. It's basically a marketplace of people that are just ready to to work on these little projects. And you can hire people as little as like, I just need this one little project done all the way to like, I need help on a monthly basis or like some long-term relationship. So the fact that these platforms exist and we were even talking about your son doing DoorDash. I mean, to me, that's a gig economy sort of situation where it's like, Hey, I got two hours to burn. Let me go pick up a couple of DoorDashes. What it unlocks is the ability not only to make more money, but I think to develop more skills. And that, that was the one thing that unlocked for me. It kept things interesting for me because I was doing marketing and picking up different projects that were for different industries. So you, you think about, I've been working for Zenium for 14 years. Uh, this is my 14th year. And we're in the HR industry. And so if I'm doing marketing for the same company for 14 years, you could see how my skills might get pretty stale. But the fact that I'm doing marketing for, I think I have like nine or 10 retainer clients on a monthly basis across different industries. So imagine the types of marketing that I'm having to learn and then not only learn and, and apply to those those clients that I have on a on a side hustle basis, I can even if some of those things apply to Zenium, I can actually bring it back and apply it to the marketing that I'm doing here. So it's like almost like a free training ground for Zenium as well. Wow. And, and do you find that it's been enriching in a case? Because usually when folks have been at a job for 10 years, you know, they get kind of bored, they're on yeah. cruise control. Right. So this can reinvigorate things, if you will. I I believe that wholeheartedly. It keeps things fresh. I mean, to be honest, stressful at some points. It's a it's a business. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm running a business for myself. I was telling you before we started recording, I'm pretty risk averse. So the fact that I'm able to to build this on the side and and dabble and take on as much as I'm willing to take on, there's just so many benefits to doing a side hustle that I see the upsides 
more than I see the downsides for a lot of people, not only on the employee side. So if an employee is like, Hey, I'm, I, I want to do the side hustle and employers has to decide whether or not they're okay with that. They should be okay with it because to your point, it's, it's reinvigorating. It keeps them engaged. They're learning new skills that they might be able to apply and bring back to the organization. And then the other thing is, you give them a chance to make more money. Mm -hmm. And so that means that they may be more satisfied with their pay than if they didn't have a side hustle. So if I was telling you before, it's like there's a lot of employees now that they might want to start a family. They might want to buy a house. And and it puts a lot of pressure on an employer to keep raising their compensation, especially in these times with inflation. Mm -hmm. It gets pretty frustrating if if your wages are staying pretty stagnant. So the fact that you might allow some space for employees to go have a side hustle and have something that they can do on the side. It gives them an opportunity to, to earn more money. There's nothing wrong with that. And what would you say the, the greater reward is? is? Is it the extra money? Is it the additional skills that you're learning? What have you gotten the most out of? It's so hard to pick one thing. I mean, probably money. <laughs> <laughs> it's given me some space to be comfortable my wife doesn't have to work a full-time job. We got two young kids at home, so it's pretty nice to give our family flexibility. But beyond the money part, like, because I, I always feel like once your basic needs are met, then there's got to be something else. There's mm-hmm. got to be a purpose or or some other reason why you're doing it. For me, I think it's the skill building. I think that's probably the second reason I love it is I'm able to learn things. Like, for example, say one of my clients come to me and say, um, Hey, look, I'm trying to build out a CRM database. This is this is actually happened. This is kind of recency bias uh, with this. So client comes to me and says, I'm looking to build out a CRM database. And I'm looking to merge data from an existing database over to this one and um, build some email campaigns off of that data. Okay. Never necessarily done that. I've done it in bits and pieces, but now I have to go learn that mm-hmm. to do it for the client. But then that actually translates to even the work I do at Zenium. So I've built skills, make money doing that on the side hustle basis, and then I'm able to, to bring that back and apply it to the work that I'm doing for my full-time job. So skill building is a huge one. The other thing is the personal branding. Mm-hmm. That's actually how you found me. You found me, I think, through my website, but it was through a podcast I did that was not, I don't even think it was a Zenium one. And so I'm able to, to build a network that I otherwise wouldn't have had if that makes sense. So I'm able to kind of build this little ecosystem that's sort of attached to Zenium in some ways, but I'm building my own. It's kind of a beautiful thing if you think about it. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things I give the the leadership at Zenium a lot of credit for because by building your brand, yes, it's helping you, but it's helping Zenium also. And you're rubbing elbows with more and more people expanding that net, if you will, that you cast. And ultimately, I mean, I know some CEOs might think, well, gosh, you know, if Brandon really grows this thing, he could go out on his own or something like that. But you've been here a long time. So what would you say to that CEO that's worried about allowing people to have that flexibility? I think there's some truth to that. I've had conversations where it's like, oh, you're, are you like trying to build something where you're just going to eventually leave? I've never been at that point where I've really wanted to build this up into a full, like an actual business where I go off full time, maybe even hire people. Like I've never, haven't really been interested in that. So I've been able to dab in the entrepreneurial stuff and build the side thing and it's fine the way it is. And I think for CEOs, uh, leaders, managers, whoever's interacting with employees who want a side hustle and are, are considering this and if they're afraid about it, I think the risks of not keeping them engaged and happy are worse. So if you don't allow them to do this and they're not engaged and they're maybe not meeting the pay standards that they're at, I think your risks of losing them are worse than if you allow them the space to have a side hustle. They make more money, they build more skills or anything that you're afraid of that might happen out of it. I think those are lower risks when you when you look at it holistically. Yeah, absolutely. Where I could see where, you know, an employer or CEO would see that a lot of these skills that you have, you know, being an entrepreneur, having ambition, showing innovation, those are great things to have in an employee. And even if that maybe they go away three or five years from now, but if they contribute to the company and go somewhere, that's a win-win too, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's interesting because in, especially with the stuff that I'm doing, I'm, I'm interacting with owners 
quite frankly. And with my full-time job at Zenny, I'm very little interaction with owners because I'm, I mean, I'm a leader within the company, but a very contributor level, like function. If you think about it, I'm tactically marketing. I've got people to help me do the tactical stuff, but I'm not interacting with business owners on a daily basis. I mean, you might, you're in, on the sales side where you're interacting with leaders of organizations. I just don't have that, that opportunity on a regular basis. So the fact that I'm doing that for my side hustle business interacting with owners, leaders who are trying to build out a marketing function, essentially. Those are skills that I'm building or, or I'm able to network with people and just get in their minds of like, look, I'm trying to drive leads and revenue and all these things. And I never would have had that otherwise. So I actually think it makes me a better marketer for Zenium because I'm getting in the minds of these business owners and how they're thinking. So that's, and I know not every side hustle is going to have that opportunity to, to interact with that same persona, but it's definitely helped me for sure. Yeah. So, so it's helping you grow. And, and the way I think of it is, it's making you become the best version of yourself, really. Yeah. I mean, in a perfect world, that's, that's what's happening. There are some times where it's, it's a little much, like I said, this is a nights and weekends thing. So sometimes when I'm doing it, it is a little overwhelming. I bet it is. So for our CEOs thinking about this, I mean, were there parameters that Zenium set up and said, hey, you know, I mean, there's some things that are no brainers right. and so forth. But, you know, just to help the CEOs out there that are thinking about this, if they were to put some parameters, you know, what would you recommend? Fortunately for me, like I have, um, it's a very safe culture, open, authentic, and I haven't ran into too many situations where we really had to set ground rules for it. There were a couple, like not necessarily conflicts of interest, but there were a couple of things that bubbled up, like, you know, with a Zenium client or something like that, where it's like, hey, I might be helping them. And I obviously don't want to sour an existing relationship. So, I, you know, I needed to ask for permission on those. And I got the blessing. I think where it becomes complicated for side hustle is if the side hustle is in, the, is in direct competition with what you're like, if Zenium provided marketing services, for example, and then I'm going to go out and do marketing services, that's in direct competition. So that would be, that'd be a no go. But I think in, in my situation, it's worked out pretty well. I would say, you know, if a CEO leader's listening, they're like, you know, I want to be able to allow my employees to become the best version of themselves. If they want to do a side hustle, I want to let them do it. What I would say is set some ground rules on the time that they can spend. Like, can they, you know, carve out a meeting during the day, during the work day, if, if they really needed to? Like, be clear on those expectations. Like, if you want to allow them to do that, like, have them check in with you if you really need to, or make sure they put it on their calendar far in advance, or be clear that, look, this is only an after hours thing. Where I think it can get risky too, is if you're, if you're constantly, you're trying to build this personal brand on your own and you're out in public. And if it directly conflicts with the brand of the organization you work for, that's where it can get really complicated. Luckily, mine's pretty, um, Mine's pretty safe, but like I, I can imagine, like you get into politics or something, or or, or the weed business, the <laughs> weed business, or and that's not a direct core value of the organization. That could be that's where it can get a little muddy. But I think over communication is the best advice I could give anybody. Is when anything comes up like this, I would I would err on the side of like just over communicate and set ground rules. And then what about the other side of the equation? Let's say you're an employee and you want to enrich your job and you want to grow and you want to have a conversation with your boss. I mean, it's kind of a weird and awkward thing because you're kind of scared you might get fired, you know, but what kind of guidance can you give to folks that are, because ideally the company wants to keep that employee. Maybe they don't know what's in the head of that employee. Right. Uh, I don't know if I'm the best person to give advice on this one because uh, as you know, like my leader is Angela Perkins and she is, she's given me all the space I need to. She, she was rooting for me. In other words, she's like, giving me the space to be the best version of myself. And so these conversations are easy with mm -hmm. her. I've, I've had conversations with her about taking on certain jobs or, or working with a particular client. And like, and I think she probably keeps a mental tally of like how many clients I have and, and maybe it could get worried once in a while, but she's never expressed it to me. So I've been fortunate enough to work with people that support me, even with my outside endeavors. And I hope other people, you know, who are considering side hustles have those types of leaders that give them the space to, to do that, you know, and leaders listen to this podcast too. And I, I just want to wholeheartedly like say, if you want your people to thrive and be engaged in the work, you've got to let them be the best version of themselves in and outside of work. And if that means that they come to you and say like, Hey, look, you know, I'm, I want to dabble in this business. I'm, I don't know if it's 
going to become a full-time thing or if it's just something I want to do on the side, but I, I want to try it out, I would support that. Yeah. And, and I think a big part of it that you touched on is, is not only the culture of the company, but also the leadership and management style of the leader too, you know, and if one of those two isn't there, it might be a little bit harder to get it done. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I would say like for the micromanagers out there in, in this world, they're probably not going to be too keen on that. They're already paranoid. They're already yeah. paranoid. They're like, oh, th- this person's like one foot out the door. But I've I've never had a one foot out the door situation with mine. It's always been fun to do. It keeps me engaged. It keeps me fresh. I've always told people because a lot of people are like, I don't understand like, why do you have a full time job, but you'd like do this on the nights and weekends. And I'm, I'm like, it keeps me fresh. Because otherwise, I'm always of the belief of like, you're not growing, you're dying, you're going the other way. And I think people stay in a job for a long time, they master it. And then I'm not saying I mastered my job yet, because it's always evolving. But I think there's some times you, you coast and you get stale. And I think this invigorates me. Yeah, I, I would see where folks have been at a job for 10 years or more, where this would be even more critical, you know, to keep those folks and keep them interested and engaged, especially in this environment. Yeah, because absolutely. a lot of people are staying with organizations one, two years, and they're jumping. And I don't know, the reasons probably vary why they jump, if they need a new type of engagement, if they're just, if they're already bored, more money. But I think the side hustle thing solves a lot of those problems. But with a type of employee, especially this Generation Z coming out, and I'm overgeneralizing here, but I think people do want the balance of, like, I only want to work 32, 40 hours a week. I mean, this four-day work week thing is coming up more and more. And I fully support that. So this side hustle thing is not for everybody because it's like, you're telling me, like, work a 40-hour job and then try to build a business on the side and no thanks. It's not for everybody. So I fully, I get that. No, it's interesting because I read a, a Harvard Business Review and, you know, some of the key reasons that they said, you know, it's a good reason to consider side hustles. They talk about learning new skills, which you talked about. Mm-hmm. They talked about building your network and expanding it. I'm kind of curious on that one. I'll stop for a second. Yeah. Have you found where you had a client, you know, that, you know, you worked with that you were able to bring across the table to the Zenium side or strengthen a relationship and saw benefits there? I am on the spot. I can't think of a situation. I know it's worked the other way where it's like it was a Zenium client and they're like, hey, I wish we could do marketing as good as you at, at Zenium. I'm like... Well, that's flattering. Also, like I can give you some guidance and help. And sometimes I just help people uh, because it's not a huge engagement. They're just like looking for some pointers and I I will gladly do that. But, uh, and that actually strengthens the relationship as any of too. So like, um, I ran across a situation the other day where a CEO was looking for some guidance on like Excel and that's not really my, that's not my side hustle at all, but I'm an advanced Excel user and they're like, I am trying to like build formulas for financial sheets and stuff. And I'm like, Dude, let's stop on a screen share. I'll walk you through some things. And I could see that like something like that could turn into a side hustle for somebody pretty easily. But overall, when you're just being helpful to people, it just strengthens relationships overall. And so that's that's how I see all the work that I've done is it strengthened my brand, but it's my brand is attached to the Zenium brand as well. And I think that's the case for a lot of people is like necessarily their whole identity is wrapped up into their employer, but it's attached to it. And and it works in a negative way too. Like, don't get me wrong. Like you build this brand that flies in the face of whatever the core values of the organization are. If those are in conflict, that's where it can get really messy. Luckily mine's been in harmony, like complete harmony. So it's, I think overall it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because the next point is what you just touched on enhancing your brand, you know, which is not only your personal brand, but the Zenium brand, how you've been able to do that. Yeah. What's, uh, I think what's interesting is Zenium is about having people grow. Like we want to create a great workplace where people can thrive. Like you've said, bring your whole self to work, be highly engaged. And I think when you give people that opportunity to be their, their best self inside and outside of the organization, build their own brand, you get to take that wherever you want. Like, so whether or not that person is going to stay there for the long haul, like you've given them an opportunity to, to thrive, to have this brand that they can take with them that could build a better life for them. Like if they wanted to start a business or they go find another job, like you've set them up for success. And I think that's the right thing to do personally. That's just my core belief is like, while people are here, maybe it's a short term gig that they work for you. Right. But if you give them a chance to grow and thrive and be the best version of themselves and they leave, you should be happy about that. Like as a manager leader, like, wow, I unlocked like the best version of that person and now they get to be successful long-term and I'm rooting for them. Yeah. That's one thing, you know, that not to toot our own horn, but I really am amazed is when, when someone leaves, we really celebrate it and not like, Hey, yeah, you're leaving. No, we're happy for you. 
genuinely are. And I know sometimes yeah. they even come back, you know. So I think we had this 30 years ago, you know, you stuck with one company and you got the gold watch, but things have just changed so much that uh, it's not black and white now. You got to find that right shade of gray. Yeah, that's that's an interesting comment you made just about people coming back to like that's happened several times. And I think like it's painful when people leave in the moment, like because you may have a heavy workload and somebody you might leave or something and it's like, ah, oh, this, this sucks. But at the same time, like you just saw them like go grab a vice president level job where they had a director job here. Like you should be proud of that. And if you leave them with a great experience while they're there with you, they may come back around, but even more so if they have the side hustle, they've built this personal brand, they've built this giant network and they talk about you after they leave or while they're there, it's going to reflect back on you. I always look at it like when, when you do networking, it's like these you're growing these little networks and they all are sort of attached to each other. And then it's, when you put them together, it's like this giant ecosystem. And that's how I think of employees. It's like if you allow people to build these personal brands while they're there with you and even beyond, and it's a great experience for both parties, the ecosystem has grown and it's this giant network that never existed before. Like we're a bunch of people operating inside of an organization. The organization is not a person. It's made up of a bunch of people working. And I think the better off people, like when they are thriving, they've built their own personal brand and network. It reflects right back on the organization. And and it builds something beautiful long-term. I wholeheartedly believe that. So I know we just had a book club meeting. We had talked about the elephant in the room. I kind of feel like this is an <laughs> elephant that exists in the corporate world. Almost everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. They want to get started, but they're really scared and so forth. You know. So any right. final advice you can give to, again, the employee or the CEO? I think on the employee side, I think the barrier to entry in, in entrepreneurship has always been cost. People think it's expensive to get started. And maybe it is for certain things. I can imagine like having a product or something, you got to build a prototype, you've got to build scale to it. Like there's maybe a lot of expenses that go into it. But like with what I'm doing, and I've already had a computer, maybe I need a video camera, maybe I need podcast equipment. Well, actually, I already have that. So the expenses are low, overheads low. So like basically any of the stuff I build is pure profit. And so that feels pretty good. To, to be able to like, oh, I can be entrepreneurial as a side hustle and be um, like almost 100% profitable. So that's pretty nice. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a lot of people are thinking like that's the barrier is like, oh, it's expensive to start a business and it doesn't have to be. And then on the employer side is it's all fear based. It's like, ah, this person's trying to build something and they're going to leave me. And what I said earlier, just a few minutes ago about when people are here, try to get them as engaged as possible. Give them the chance to be the best version of themselves. And all that's going to reflect back on the business, even if they left, because that's the fear. It's like, they're not going to get their work done. They're going to leave me. It's all reputation at the end of the day. Like you build a network, personal brand. They talk about you. It all comes back. Some of these employees, they're boomerang employees that come back. Um, even if they don't, they're going to talk positively about you in the market. A lot more to gain than lose. Yeah, and I'll just I highlight. I think there's so many things to gain from this. Yeah, yeah. The CNBC article, a couple of nuggets that they had was they talked about how you show diversity by having outside interests, which is right. another benefit. They also talked about how clients actually value someone who has a side hustle because they feel like that person has more empathy and more understanding of the business world and then also helps everybody really, you know, by by casting that wider net, if you will. That's good. Yeah. Well, any final things you want to add, Brandon? Because I think it's been a great conversation. And I think I'm hoping that folks will start thinking about how to do this. Because again, you know, things have just changed so much with this gig economy that I think CEOs really need to be more open minded. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually curious where it's all going to go. I'm, I've never thought about doing a topic like this. But when you talked about it, I was like, oh, this makes total sense. I've just sort of organically done this and never put it really a name to it. But the gig economy thing is not going away. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the thing that I'm looking at now is like this next generation of workers, they don't necessarily want to work a 40 hour work week for the same organization. So maybe they find an employer that they can work full time at 32 hours a week or even part time. And then they mix the rest of it with gig economy stuff so they can balance out the life that they want and they work when they want to work, where they want to work. And I think the gig economy stuff allows them to do that. So I think like in this, in the, especially in this environment we're in with the great resignation and inflationary pressures and all that, I think you got to get creative. I think if I'm an employer right now, I'm a bunch of people or I'm trying to attract people and hire people. No stone should go unturned. I think you've got to get really creative with what you're offering people. And I think the, the gig economy is one little 
piece to that, but I think it's a good benefit. I agree. I don't know a CEO that's not recruiting and looking for folks, you know, so you just have to do things differently. This is a good nugget to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Al, thanks for letting me uh, be on the other side of the mic for once. It's, I don't get the opportunity. I like to be the one asking questions, but you made it easy. I appreciate you. Thanks. I enjoyed it. All right. This is a lot of fun. Take care. All right.